but apparently I'm missing something really funny because. Um, yeah, no, I'm not even looking. I, oh, I Tevis, <laughs> Tevis is Tevis, I'm don't dying. I no, can't. Bro, don't, no, listen, I can't. Don't, <laughs> don't I ever not play have it up. You can't yeah. play poker, bro. Because you. Can't <laughs> I'm so play. bad at it. I'm so I, bad. It's been cracking me up, and I didn't even look at the chat. Just, just I, laughing I, this, for me. This right here, th no, this one right here got us, <laughs> and then this one right here. <laughs> it's like it's when I read it on the screen, it's not even funny, but I know I'm not supposed to laugh, and that makes it even more funny. I don't, I can't do it, man. I, I should just not have the chat up. It's I don't even bad. have bad, like, like it doesn't make my eyes bigger. Like, so bi weekly special episode with the guest, the stock markets nerd. I am Brad, I'm 25. I worked for a fund for a very short period of time. Got my master's in finance, worked for Motley Fool for a few years and then started writing my own newsletter. What was the first thing that like got you into the deep dive of like learning about SoFi? It was during that back craze. So um, a few of those presentations drew me in. I think I ended up investing in like three of them and SoFi is the only one left that I own. But really the projections that they offered were extremely exciting in this value proposition of combining the back end and, and the software with, with the front end consumer facing product, saving on things like software stacks, via vertical integration and being able to sell that to competitors and, and taking part in this explosive fintech growth. And instead of just relying on brand and brand power to kind of win in a commoditized banking space, that competition agnostic branch, which is what I view Galileo and Technicus as was really what got me so interested in SoFi. And going off of that question, where does SoFi sit relative to other holdings for you? Like the waiting and then maybe just the general sort of glimpse into your portfolio, like in terms of number of holdings or, or whatnot. I own 19 companies. 90% of my, my equity is in 14 names or 13 names because one of those is cash. So so 13. SoFi is number nine, but I mean, it shifts between fourth largest and 10th largest on a pretty much daily basis. Like they're very tightly packed in. Have you just been sort of DCAing your way through? I've been adding pretty aggressively over the last six months. Really started a, a accumulating and accelerating that accumulation pace a few months ago. Really when the EBITDA multiple kind of got around 20 um, in terms of forward EBITDA but is when I started to really lean in. Obviously, we we hit it out of the park with earnings in some sectors and some places not. Stock reacted well 18% and then it rallied another 20% after that. What were the few critical like factors of SoFi's Q4 that you think really just add to your bull thesis and then maybe something off the top of your head that you're worried about? It wasn't their best report. Uh, it, it's funny because it's been the best reaction in terms of share price, but <laughs> it was probably their worst report in like three or four quarters, I think. I, it was still a very strong quarter. I mean, they'd be on the top line by 4%, despite not getting that December student loan volume ramp that they were anticipating that was in the guide, beating regardless of that and, and continuing to compound it at a two-year clip of well above 50%. Now we're at pushing a $2 billion revenue run rate for next year. That's It's getting pretty big and, and, and the growth is, is still, still strong, but, but growth doesn't matter. I'm unless there's operating leverage and, and like was hinted at, there's there's been plenty of that. So, and so not only did they expand their EBITDA margin by 1400 basis points year over year from 1.6% to, to 6%. And I think for the full year, it was like 2.7% last year and then 9% for 2022 or something like that. And, and I know some people here adjusted EBITDA and rolled a rise and, and that's fair. But pairing that with, with the guidance for a while, it was sounding like, yeah, we'll turn net income profitable at some time in 2024. And, and then they moved it out to Q4 2023, th this past quarter. I had to go to the transcript the next day to, to reread this to make sure that I read it correctly. But the, the, the incremental gap net income metrics that they gave out of 42% in Q4, I don't know the full year one that they, they gave out, but it was it was pretty gaudy. It just, it gets you excited about where this company can be in a few years, especially when their big money loser, which was financial services, is now in contribution profit positive sometime this year. And they're at negative 67%, which, which is not great. I, I will... I will give people that. That does not sound good, but it sounds a lot better when you hear that they were um, at, at a negative 160% margin just a year ago. So, I mean, rapid operating leverage there, it's going to turn positive at some point this year. Across the board, exciting from a profitability standpoint with, with a tech platform where we've gotten some operating deleverage over the last few years because they've been spending so aggressively on Galileo. And now Technicis is a margin headwind as well. But them telling us in 2023, margins are going to trough and, and we're going to start to have leverage in that segment as well. They're clicking wherever they can click. And unfortunately, this student loan thing is, is, is really, I mean, annoying for its potential because it, it is really lowering the ceiling but 
at the same time, they're going to have a decent share of the market like they had before the moratorium was in place whenever it comes back. All in all, it was a really strong quarter. I mean, for the year, their loan market share went from 4.5% to 6% of their demographic, which is extremely affluent, which is why their charge off and delinquency rates still look so good, which is not the same for all of my holdings right now. RIP Upstart. Very early on, you said uh, it wasn't the greatest quarter from SoFi. And I agree. What I think was really spectacular, what the market liked was that it really proved itself to be the last lender standing in terms of Lending Club and Upstart and all of these companies not performing very good in Q3 and Q4 when SoFi continued to put up great numbers. We obviously are depegging ourselves from just an industry standard. Things that concern me a little bit, uh, two things that I would point out. One is along the lines of that moratorium. Their guidance anticipates that they get that student loan volume ramp starting 60 days after June 30th. But really, none of us know when it's going to come back because politicians suck and they work really slowly and they all have their agendas. And, and we really don't know. Just take it out of the full year guidance and create a little upside surprise would have been nice. And then the other thing was some language around Galileo and the tech platform. It sounded like a client leaving to their own payment processor and costing them $6 million in revenue. So to me, that sounded like churn. And, and the second thing was that changing go to market from maybe weaker fintech players that they're not confident can actually survive this downturn. But then saying that our growth organically is going to slow to low double digits and, and then accelerate thereafter. A little bit concerning there. And then Technicus will add to that organic growth too um, in, in, the, in the first half of the year. But that was a bit underwhelming to me. And, and I'm, I, I would like to see that reacceleration like they're telling me to expect in the second half of the year. So something I will be watching quite closely. From what I can see, the customer that did leave was Revolut, which I'm pretty sure was a pretty large customer for us. In the same quarter, they said that they are, are partnering with Stripe or something along these lines to, to do a lot of their payments. So so there, there's two things to pick out. And since we're starting with the negatives, I, I kind of want to add one more uh, to the list around the earnings. So student loans, pretty much in my mind, that's a write off for the year, because even though they're going to start in September, they did mention on the call that it's going to be a very slow ramp after that fact. And I mean, look, I mean, it's been pushed 11 times or 12 times, it can definitely get pushed again, uh, especially now that it's in the hands of courts like that can be a long drawn out process. So it might not even be in their hands to ramp up. But so that that's essentially a write off for the year in my mind, of course, the other write off for the year is home loans, you know, they did mention that they're transitioning to other fulfillment partners. On an interview with Fox, Anthony Noto also mentioned that uh, they're not putting as many resources to home loans just with the interest rate situation being where it is. So they're transitioning those resources to focus more on the personal loan side more on the SoFi bank and you know the checking and savings direct deposits. Um, that, that side of the business, because that's the side of the business that's clicking in this type of market and less so the, uh, the home or the student loan. So both of those two, I would imagine are complete write-offs for the year, but at the same time, both of those have been, you know, been piggybacked by personal loans for like the last 12 months. They're on a sequential and year over year decline. I don't think investors are really counting on those to make a, an impact in the first place. Growth is going to slow, but you'd like, obviously, ideally for it to be that slowing process, the first derivative to be as, as, as low as possible. And this home fulfillment problem has been an annoying issue for a few quarters now. And one of the analysts kind of pointedly asked them, but you've been talking about this for several quarters and it doesn't seem like we've gotten anywhere. So what's going on? Kind of think to yourselves, okay, when is this going to happen? Because They've been talking about it for a year and a half now. I mean, I think they've they've hinted sort of at wanting to actually own their fulfillment partners. Yeah, so they reiterated that same point on the call and also in subsequent interviews. Their old partner got acquired. And so they've been spending the past like 18 or so months making this transition. Noto said on the call that they had made more progress in the last two months than they made in the previous 18, just fast tracking a new partner. Now that they know the external dependencies that they have on these fulfillment providers, they want to go all in house with home loans. So it just leads me to think that since they took so long to get a new fulfillment partner, and now that they fast tracked a new candidate, that candidate, whoever that is, makes it a prime acquisition target from SoFi's perspective so that they don't run into this in the future again. This is Steven's latest article, and this is a chart on student loan originations, personal loan originations, home loan originations, and total originations. The interesting thing here about the, the student loan debate is that they kind of said they, they, they've spent the past year not factoring that in into their guidance or into a lot of their analysis. It kind of seemed like he was brushing it off. He was like, look, we get it. It sucks. It's annoying, but we've gone through the past five, six quarters without worrying about it, even though we've said it's coming. Brad, I'd love to know your opinion on the risk of becoming practically, you know, a 70% personal loan business. That's why it's, it's so important to me personally that that SoFi is very strictly underwriting to this tight credit band of, of customers. So I think their FICO for personal is over 745 and for student it's over 760 and, and mean income is, is well over the, the American average. The ABS or 
asset backed security markets remain open to them throughout all of this. Like they, they were closing several hundred dollar million deals through the thick of financial condition tightening and the peak of Volcker taper tantrum or, or whatever you want to call it. And they were selling these gigantic loan pools while they were maintaining delinquency and charge off rates well after the stimulus and payment holiday sugar high kind of ended. So the combination of their underwriting and how they're able to kind of use posits uh, and this cheaper source of capital to really juice the APY that they're offering for to consumers to act as that really attracted top of funnel. Not only do they have that available to them, but when fast money hedge funds and, and, and these capital markets turned off for a lot of the market, they did not turn off for SoFi and they it could continue to be business as usual because delinquency and charge off rates remain so far well below the pre-pandemic levels and they still are. And then Crystal Point kind of pounded his chest a little bit on the call and was like, yeah, that's going to continue. You can you can pretty much expect that to continue on that outperformance versus their competition. Do I love that so much of this business is now loans? Not ideally. And, and I'd love Galileo and Technicus Growth to re-accelerate like they're saying, because that's very important to me in terms of the bull case. But in terms of the quality of that loan book and how they've handled it through a really tough situation, it, it makes me a lot more comfortable with that concentration risk in terms of personal loans. Student loan origination, home loan origination is decreasing year over year. However, the personal loan origination has been so explosive that we've actually been growing our total portfolio year after year after year. Gallo and Technosis, obviously slowing of VC funding of all these new fintechs or neobanks and everything like this. We're not getting nearly as fast of, of new clients in that section. However, now they've been talking in great depth about the B2B market. Galileo was very one, one dimension. It had a phenomenal payment processing API and, and slick software, and it worked very well. But this whole theme of multi-core banking was something that it couldn't offer, which is what these, these gigantic B2B clients need to offer their customers in terms of what they're selling to these gigantic companies like H&R Block and, and, and some of these other bellwethers that they've landed. They require not only payment processing, but checking and savings almost reminds me of Shopify. Them kind of combining all these um, business operations, and for them, it's banking <coughs> operations and banking functions into one platform and one back end so that you have one familiar user interface, which is there's a lot less friction for customers because it's familiar. It's an interesting value proposition. So by being able to kind of, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but but unify those, those disparate data silos and product silos, you can really create a much better experience, but you can also lower the total cost of ownership and, and, and maintaining that. Do you think that it's only B2B to C? The total addressable market of AWS of FinTech, what is it revolutionizing? Why would someone choose us over, over some of the bigger players? It, it's two things, creating a better experience for the consumer in which they don't have to learn as much and don't have to familiarize themselves for so long with these products. But it's also, again, saving them on, on total cost of ownership. All these companies uh, like, like Shopify and Olo and trying to be the AWS of something else, of, of restaurants or of commerce or, or things like that, they publish total cost of ownership case studies and, and how much cost savings they're driving. It sounds kind of gimmicky to say, total cost of ownership is lower because how do you quantify that? What does that mean? Hopefully they'll, they'll publish some case studies in the future. And I've talked to some people at the company where it sounds like they're going to, but yeah, it, it really is about that two prong value proposition of better consumer experience and total cost of ownership savings. There, there definitely is a gigantic B2B market and I have no idea what the actual number is in terms of TAM off the top of my head. From B2B to C to small merchant businesses, SMBs or pure B2B players, the total addressable market is large enough where the only risk is really execution risk. Can they continue to get some big names moving on to their ecosystem? Do you think that uh, that Technosis was a good purchase? If it does what we've been told it's going to say it's going to do and teased over the last few quarters in terms of putting them in those conversations to land a, a top 10 bank a, a, as a as a customer or, or, or land a, a massive fund or, or something along those lines, then yes, because that really does require them offering a lot more than just payment processing. Because I, I mean, the theme of, of, the, of the last year and then the last several years is just doing more with less and under consolidation. So whoever can do more of that and, and consolidate more functions and more utility onto one platform and one vendor, lower total cost of ownership, sorry to continue sounding redundant, but that's extremely important. And that's what Technicis really allowed Galileo to do by not being just this one-dimensional payment processor. And if they can sign a JP Morgan or something like that. And um, the idea is that Technicist put them in these conversations and, and, and put them in competition for these gigantic whales, which would which would solve this revenue growth acceleration very quickly because the revenue ramp would just be crazy compared to what they normally get with these tiny wins that, um, that they're announcing. It's sort of conditional upon if Galileo and Technicist together can land these gigantic customers that Noto and LaPointe seem to be confident that they can. But that is what I would like to see to kind of objectively answer, was that a good decision?
if you had to pick between consumer banking versus Galileo, what is the thing that you like the most about the investment thesis? I like Galileo better and I, I like owning the back end and the software better just because, I mean, fintech is a really explosive growth area and there are so many brands competing for eyeballs and competing to draw people onto their platforms for what are, at the end of the day, pretty similar product offerings, high yield savings accounts. And so if I can kind of differentiate itself there, but for the most part, a checkings account and they're largely commodities with a few bells and whistles to make them more appealing to consumers. So by SoFi having these technology clients like Robinhood and Chime with Galileo as revenue generating partners for, for Galileo, that kind of allows them to participate in this, this fintech evolution or fintech revolution and, and all this growth that's expected over the next decade without solely relying on competing on brand power, which special brands, they're very hard to call out and, and to see before it's extremely obvious in hindsight. So relying on just a juggernaut consumer brand and yeah, SoFi, they're getting your money right and their marketing machines and it's all it's all good. That doesn't make me nearly as excited or nearly as comfortable as Galileo and Technosys and, and SoFi all together participating on the back end and, and serving these gigantic fintech companies that are spending so much money to capture the market share of what will largely be not a very high margin opportunity and prize. So what is high margin is software and technology and, and differentiation there, especially when they now that they migrated it from on-premise to the cloud, which I think they said they wrapped up last quarter. But that really is what excites me more about the company. And that really is, I think, what insulates it from this commoditization that's inevitable for fintech, just like it was for legacy banking and legacy financial services. So do you think that Galileo and Technosys seem a little unfocused? When I bought into SoFi, I wasn't thinking that we're going to be doing a lot of whole B2B payment deals or and then also Galileo and Technosys, they're growing, but like, it's just, it's not nose bleeding it's growth right. that we're all here for. I feel like a year ago, we had a different story about what Galileo and Technosys was trying to do and what they're doing now. It's just the market right now. I think there's very little clients coming into the space. We're hunting bigger fish now. We need to land a large financial institution. They've been talking about it. They've been talking about landing large retail consumer platforms. There's kind of different waves to how Galileo and Technosys make money, right? It's bring on the actual clientele. Once we add those clients, that's not immediate revenue, immediate account ads. That comes later. And and, and this is something that Chris Lapointe spoke about is that once that actually happens, then we add accounts and then we add revenue. $6 million in terms of churn, that's a big hit for them in, in terms of Galileo's growth rate and the incremental revenue they're putting on. And for the next few quarters, that's going to be in the year over year comp. I think they implied so like 11 to 13% growth. That, that's what I can only infer from them saying low double digit growth. So definitely going to be looking for, for that ramping of growth there because it, it is an important part of the investment. And I do think it's that churn. It's the fact that they've kind of pivoted their go to market. And it's also the fact that the company's kind of relying on, on new logos right now for growth or, or finding growth very difficult just because the approval process are just, is just being drawn out and lengthened so much. And just because people are trying to delay spend while, while kind of the, the macro picture shapes up a little bit and hopefully becomes a little less daunting. So um, they are kind of reliant on, on landing these big fish right now for a reacceleration of growth. And, and it is sort of a tough sell. I noticed in the uh, technology segment that the margins had declined. Excluding technicists, the contribution margin was lower in Q4, 24%, I think, this quarter versus 38% the year prior. The actual expenses for that technology platform had increased. It seemed as though that was a trend that had started a, a couple of quarters and it was just going lower and lower in terms of that actual margin. Of course, the growth is slowing because of the macro condition with regards to like the B2B space in general, lowering spend. But I'm curious, was there anything specifically for this quarter that contributed to the higher expenses and the lowering margins? And is that something that you think will continue in 2023? Yeah, so a great, I mean, great question. I, I think a few things that I kind of want to answer that. So first, the, the shift of the cloud has been very expensive for, for them. I mean, and, and it wrapped up last quarter, which is why I think leadership was able to confidently tell us that this is the bottom for, for the tech platform contribution margin. Basically, now that that upfront spend has been incurred on, on that migration, they can kind of focus on R&D and product development and or finishing the unification of, of, of Technicis and Galileo and finish integrating that with, with, so, with SoFi's own tech stack so it can enjoy cost savings and vertical integration so it can offer things like higher API and better top of funnel and all those wonderful things. Part of the investment cases is them telling us that Galileo Technicis is going to operate at a 30 plus percent contribution margin run rate. I mean, they're now X Technicis 600 basis points away and with it a thousand, they've got a ways to go. And, and, and I don't care about the chat right now. Let's go on to stock-based compensation. $70 million, 16% of revenue. That was this quarter. It seems to be going down. What are your thoughts? The two themes are going down fast and needing to continue going down fast. Yeah, it was 16% of sales, still sort of egregious. But when you look at the year-over-year -year comp at 28 
8% of sales, it becomes a little bit less ridiculous because they're yeah. moving in the right direction. That fall paired with the fact that they told us or reiterated that it's going to get below 10% of revenue starting in 2024, paired with the fact that they're now telling us gap net income profitability is coming Q4 2022. That gap net income profitability relies on them kind of getting their shit together on stock comp um, and, and them guiding to that in, in 12 months is them telling us that that's what they plan to do. So 16% is really not that egregious for a company growing this quickly and, and trying to hire so aggressively and expand so aggressively and and add so many products like like Technosys and its um, tech platform all, all at the same time. But it, because it, it has a, bank, a banking charter and so because it's now sort of considered a bank with a, with a lot of bells and whistles by people who maybe don't believe in the company very much, 16% of sales uh, is rightfully a, a gripe that they have and, and needed to fall below 10% of revenue in 2024 for them to meet that gap that income guide right. that they've offered. And, it's an easy question because you own shares, but is SoFi undervalued? I struggle to answer that because I own it and, and still own it and I'm not trimming. So I think that kind of answers the question, but I'm, I'm very biased and have a hard time being objective. But that combination of the teens EBITDA multiple, with which EBITDA is, is I mean, Charlie Munger calls it a fake profit metric and, and, and rightfully so for a lot of companies, but paired with that gap in income guide to profitability being moved up by a few quarters, paired with that incremental color that they gave out about gap and income margin, it's going to do in, in EBIT. So getting rid of depreciation, it, it's going to be close to 300 million and, and run right EBIT pretty soon. And that should be a pretty good indication of, of where net income is going to be in, in a few years, which in terms of growth and a peg ratio, that puts them very close to one very quickly. Do your own research and, and disagree with me and tell me I'm wrong. And, <laughs> and that's completely okay. But when their EBIT is compounding at a near 100% clip over a multi-year period, and, and they're giving that extra color, it's expensive as a growth stock right now. But even as a growth stock compounding at 25 or 30% for the long term, it's going to be very affordable at this valuation very soon if they do what they say they're going to do. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but back in like 2017 and 2016, before Noto, wasn't SoFi like valued in the billions, like three or four billion dollars? There, there were some valuations thrown around in that level, and it, it's crazy to think that five, six years later, we're hovering. I think there five, was a buyout billion. offer, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like seven I, or eight billion or something like that. Yeah, I think they the received the buyout offer. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you got. I'm sure you guys know about all that the, the frat party culture stuff. And, mm. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Lighting money on fire. Like, like they they, they really work. And, 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 and he lied to in investors and, too. Yeah, he, they yeah, were not uh, getting their money right. One of the things that's been polarizing on this pod has been buy now, pay later. On the B2B side, I think mostly we're all in agreement that it's a good thing that they can just offer that to other businesses, but more on the B2C side for, for SoFi offering buy now, pay later. What's your thoughts on those and where do you think that can go? Like, do you think that that's a real potential for the business or do you think it's just something they're launching as a feature that's a nice to have for users, but doesn't really contribute to too much or doesn't have the potential to do so in the future? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of biased almost against the, the buy now, pay later as a full company. But as a tool in a toolkit, I think kind of works to combine it with checkout and all those things. But for SoFi specifically, and, and candidly, I have not tried to go through the process of buy now, pay later through SoFi. But it sounds like you go through MasterCard and, and kind of have to request this virtual branded card. And then you, know, you get acceptance and then can use it for a transaction. And to me, just, just thinking it through, and I also own shares of PayPal, so I'm very biased positively towards that company as well. But when they have the, the buy now, pay later just as a button on checkout and, and click and done, that seems more seamless and less frictiony than the form factor that they're describing here with, with the apply through MasterCard for a virtual card and then use that to, to get approved for the loan to, I don't know. It just- Sure. It, Let yeah. me uh, give a little color to that because like sure. all you got to do is go to the app, you pick how much money you want. So let's say $400, you type 400 in, you press a button and then it says approve and then it'll have another button say, add it to your Apple wallet. You click that and then you tap one more time and then it's in your Apple wallet. So you can scan it in a physical location or you can go to a website where it has Apple Pay checkout, and then you can click that and choose the, uh, the SoFi pay and fork card. PayPal has their own button. So it, it's like we're, we're piggybacking off of uh, Apple Pay. The thing that uh, Brad sort of said still stands. You still have to enter the amount that you want before the purchase versus just like, here's how much the item is, check out now. But it's all that... in one app. Cause like I have a firm, I use a firm once every month or two just to use it. And I, I wouldn't use it if I was straight into my uh, SoFi app. And I feel like SoFi in the long term would have a better data set on its users than a firm does. And they would be able to offer 
were more like you would be able to do bigger purchases with their SoFi paying for than you would be able to within a firm because just of the data SoFi has on you as a, as a member. It's just literally like a credit card. You just type how much you want and it automatically funds you a, a virtual credit card yep. that expires within a month. Anywhere that MasterCard is accepted, you can buy anything. Of course, SoFi has in the short term limitations. You can't use it to buy groceries and stuff because they're trying to test it all out. It's a very simple, easy process. I'm kind of the odd man out here on this podcast because I actually like the product and I think it's cool. And it's kind of like giving more value to SoFi's whole consumer proposition and making that more sticky. Okay, Even so though it might not make us like a bunch of money, I think it's it's something that well, well let's, let's thing. ask Brad that. So yeah. Brad, what, what is the final financial incentive for SoFi to even offer buy now pay later yeah. in SoFi app what is the financial incentive or is it just to stay in the market the, the incentive for SoFi is well all these other companies have this so if we don't have that then there's layer of flexibility in terms of, of payment schedule that they're offering that we're not and it goes back to that theme of banking services being really similar and, and needing to stand out any way you possibly can and them seeing this as a void that they need to fill and just using PayPal as another example the benefit that they get is really it's higher conversion rates and higher average order value values and that translates into more gross merchandise value or GMV for them, which means more revenue and, and, and more profit eventually. And that's really how they benefit. They don't even charge merchants for using this. They just let them enjoy this kind of, they call it a halo effect of more payment volume because you're offering that. So thinking that through on, on the SoFi side, they would definitely benefit through more interchange fees and their debit product is extremely high margin compared to pretty much everything else they have in financial services. So that would be one less friction point or one added layer of convenience that devise these shoppers to, to spend more through through the SoFi platform or through their SoFi cards for them to collect this high margin revenue. So it's just them making the experience better. So indirectly, I think it could benefit results, but in terms of buy now, pay later product on its own and in isolation, which is why I never understood these standalone buy now, pay later companies, because it has to be a tool. It has to be rounding out the toolkit and it can't be the only thing in it, but that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, if you need to dip, Brad, that's totally fine. Dip yeah, I, I, I might have to take off, but this was this was really fun and thank you very much for having me and um, looking forward to holding so far shares i guess and, and hopefully <laughs> yeah. i'm not wrong for doing so which is always possible so right. have a great night guys it was great to meet i think all of you face to face for the first time so we'll have a great weekend and, and talk soon thanks, thanks for having Brad. Appreciate it. thanks Brad. see you later something that i've been waiting for since august of 2021 is an investment platform user interface update i think amit can attest to this it sucks it's super bad but it looks as though SoFi is actually focusing on uh, revamping their user interface. I think that will put a lot of eyes on SoFi if it actually has an app that's like clean and user friendly. I think in the long term that can generate a lot of good member growth. Did that did that update you posted, Riley? It's like real that like they rolled out. It is design. real in in that it is from SoFi directly. SoFi did create this, but it is sent privately through to a few members through a sur survey. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to ask you to do something and then they record your uh, uh, in-app behavior while on this website because they want to see how easy or how well their product is. It is something that they've actually created. Uh, there's no like update on if it's going to be coming or if that's like the final product or anything like that, but it is just cool. This is the first time we've had like huge UI news in, in over a year for sure. I got a message from a SoFi insider who I kidding. would remain anonymous because wow. they are just telling me absolute undisclosed information. Anything you can share? <laughs> they, <laughs> they are not that high up. Uh, they do work in the SoFi Invest platform. From all the talks that they've been hearing, it looks like level one options are going to be coming out in Q3, not Q1. Further back than what we thought, but uh, still good to have some pretty good information come in if, if we hear anything. And how much money are you guys up this week? <laughs> 62% am... up. Riley tweeted that he is the best month. I say the best. I said, who can beat it? And there was a lot of people. You're up 62% in the month, correct? No, so that I'm not going to be able to buy SoFi at four, though. What well, I don't know. Okay, so let, can, we, can we ask this question? Do, I, I don't think this run up was necessarily healthy. I think it was very euphoric for all the wrong reasons. I, obviously, SoFi deserves to be there. I, I think we're going to get a pullback relatively to six or five. Dude, the yeah. pullback or the continued run is not dependent on SoFi. Like, I just want Agreed. you guys to understand yeah, yeah, that. It's all 100%. macro. The Fed can come and just kneecap this entire market 
with one know, dude. statement. <laughs> but it's interesting when, you know, Brad was saying like, this was one of our weaker reports and it, it ran and they actually held that run yeah. after this report because yeah. this was the report. Anthony Noto literally went on Fox. He went on CNBC on Bloomberg and I think a couple others. Every single one of those interviews, including the earnings call, they were hammering home one point and that was profitability in 2023. And I think that's what the market is looking for in this day and age when everything is rough. They're looking for profitability. 2021 was pure growth at all costs. 2023 seems to be just pure sustainability at all costs. Them just hammering home that point is almost like clickbait, you know, for a lot of people to jump in because if SoFi says Q4 profitability, they probably are internally targeting Q3 profitability, something like that. Because I think the company now has double beat ever since becoming a public company. It, it's sort of become a trend where they under promise over deliver. So that's, I mean, for me, I'm looking at like Q3 profitability even though Noto is saying Q4. I just think it's because the DPEG from other lenders means that SoFi is the last lender standing. We even lowered the amount of provisions for loan losses, opposite of what some bears were, were assuming that was going to happen. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.